Well, a flurry of uh, reopen, you know, ex-state rallies have been uh, occurring across the United States since Friday. Um, I, it really seems like what might have triggered this uh, was Trump tweeting "Liberate Michigan" and "Liberate Minnesota," um, and that prompted, I, th- I, I think, a lot of it was sort of a, an impromptu call to action for a lot of people to organize these protests um, at their state capitals. Of course, the first one, uh, I think, was uh, the "Reopen NC." Uh, you know, reopen North Carolina. I think that was the first one that I remember, but the, the Michigan one was was soon after that, or right around the time. Um, but we've seen this spread to more states. Uh, I think there was one in Minnesota, Pennsylvania, all sorts of places. And this is, like I've said before, to be expected. Uh, when you suddenly, you know, I was saying that, you know, I thought that the, the next recession uh, was going to lead to civil unrest in this country. But when you do something like this, something that is so transparently uh, the fault of the state, you know, in the, you know, as, as far as ordinary people are concerned, they can see, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I've, I'm losing everything. I can't afford to pay my mortgage. I can't pay my electric bill. I've lost my job. And it's because my governor said that I'm not allowed to go to work. It gives people a very clear villain uh, to blame uh, for all of their misfortune. And so right now we're witnessing across the country people rising up because they're frustrated because there's nothing they can do, you know, and, and a lot of uh, folks seem to actually be poo-pooing them uh, and talking about how, you know, oh, uh, these guys are just, oh, they're so dangerous and, and they're dumb and blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, and as someone who, again, has been concerned about this virus and takes it just as seriously as I ever did um, since January, I'm very concerned about it. I'm not going out, you know, putting myself in front of people because, of course, I have elderly relatives that I don't want to get sick. But you have to be able to have some empathy or compassion for people uh, who are losing their livelihoods um, and are being ruined by this lockdown and appreciate, you know, what they're trying to say. I mean, if you, if you just think that these people are brats who don't want to, you know, stay safe uh, and that's all there is to it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how I can talk, how you can even talk to someone like that. These people obviously are upset uh, because their lives are being destroyed, and they blame their governors for that, which, you know, is as fair of a person to blame as anybody. You know, I guess the lefties, since this is for some reason a partisan issue, I don't know why it is, because, you know, left-wing people are losing their jobs and their incomes too. I guess it's because people on the left are just saying, you know, no, I'm not going to pay my mortgage. I'm not going to pay my my rent. Uh, It's my right to live here. Um, I guess that's why, because I I actually – you know, I have some family who uh, owns a rental property and their left-wing tenants are, you know, straight up. No, we're never going to pay. But perhaps the right-wingers in this country I, I have a bit more of a, uh, you know, a, a conscience uh, when it comes to that sort of a thing. And they feel obligated to pay their bills. And so when they're deprived of the ability to pay their bills, uh, perhaps that strikes a deeper chord uh, on the right than it does on the left. Nevertheless, though, um, there, it, this still should enrage plenty of people who are, you know, at least center left. And maybe it does. Perhaps the reason why we're seeing uh, sort of a right wing um, component to these protests is that uh, these are being organized on social media and, uh, you know, would only be passed around among friends. And people don't have friends on Facebook of different political persuasions. Um, they are. Uh, you know, they, no, pe- Facebook is a cesspool, that's why I don't use it, uh, and people don't have particularly deep political thoughts there, but it's organized into teams. And so people typically are going to only interact with folks who are on their team. And so if someone starts passing around this thing to protest the governor or whatever, um, and they're a right-wing person, uh, then only other right-wing people are going to see it. But, you know, the longer this goes on, uh, the more you're going to see people who are willing to stand up for their rights, which are actually being violated. They have, they have a perfectly good case to make there. There's uh, uh, no real constitutional justification uh, for depriving people of their basic constitutional rights. And so, you know, it's a matter of, uh, when it comes to protesting that sort of thing, it's a matter of, you know, hey, what's in it for you? You know, is it, is it really worth your time uh, to protest uh, your rights being violated? And, it, and in this case, I think it's pretty clear Uh, that uh, these people have uh, a lot to gain uh, if they're successful in, uh, you know, in in, in agitating uh, for for what they want. 
because the alternative is financial ruin. You know, right now families and marriages are being destroyed and torn apart. This whole thing is wreaking uh, uh, total havoc on our society. And that's not something that you just paper over and, uh, you know, try and shout down anyone who speaks up about it as uh, a crybaby who wants to get everybody sick or someone who's dangerous. If you try and dismiss these people and shut them down, you're only going to make them angry. These people want to be heard. They want someone who feels their pain to acknowledge them. And nobody's doing that right now. Uh, I mean, the governor of Michigan said, you know, she was thinking about opening things up, which I, I talked about, I, I think, on Friday. Um you know, until there were all these protests, and she said, you know what, we may have to extend the lockdown just after all these protests that have been going on. And, of course, plenty of people were comparing that to a, uh, you know, to a school teacher. You know, uh, oh, you're complaining that you got detention? Well, here's another detention. You know, you can't treat human beings like children uh, and expect them to just take that, uh, at least not in America, I don't think. You know, at first, uh, I think a lot of people were willing to accept all of these lockdown, you know, restrictions because uh, they were led to believe that this was a very serious problem. And let me be clear, this, the problem with the virus is just as serious now as it was before. Uh, the, uh, the inevitable thing that's going to happen when this country eventually does have to open back up, uh, whether it's opened by force or by, you know, the choice of the governors, is there's going to be a second wave uh, when it comes to this uh, pandemic. And the problem now is that because uh, the I, I think because the government has lost so much credibility during this initial lockdown, uh, once that happens, they will be unable politically to lock down the country again. Uh, and so I guess they're trying to just maintain the lockdown throughout the whole thing. But that's just not feasible. You reach a critical mass eventually, as I discussed, of people who will not comply, and uh, your order becomes unenforceable. And then what are you going to do? Start gunning people down in the streets? Well, if you do that, that incites more rebellion, more revolution, actually. Go ahead. Try and take out a few of these armed protesters like we saw in Pennsylvania yesterday showing up at a deuce and a half. Um, go ahead. Gun them all down and see how that works out. You, um, you, you kill 10 protesters this time. Uh, there's going to be uh, 1,000 armed protesters the next time. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that, that, um, you know, if you try and crack down on these people, you're only going to produce more. The reason why we've got to this point to where there are these huge rallies uh, are because of how strict the lockdowns have been and how long they've lasted. Uh, you know, this is, um, uh, this is what you risk. I mean, actually, I've talked about this with talking about authoritarian countries before. If you lock down on people too hard, if you're too oppressive, you're going to incite rebellion. What you need to do is lock down on people and oppress them to the extent to where they... You know, they can't act as they normally would with total freedom, but they're not oppressed to the point to where they, they, they feel compelled to stand up and take that chance uh, and, and go out uh, and try to overthrow you. Because if a serious portion of the people rise up all at once against the government, well, then the government's going to fall. That's what happens every time. There's, you know, infinitely more of us than there ever will be of them. The state does not have the power to dominate uh, the civilization. All they can try and do is manage them. And, you know, the state right now is doing a very bad job at managing our society. I mean, the road we're walking down now is that eventually uh, you could see uh, these protests get out of hand enough to where, you know, they storm the Capitol, let's say, um, and they, uh, you know, they depose the governor and uh, they set up some kind of, uh, you know, revolutionary committee. Now again, obviously that's still a little far-fetched at this point, but that's the road we're walking down when you have people rising up who have, again, nothing to lose at this point because they're losing everything. That's when people are the most dangerous, when, they, when they've when they lost their fear because, you know, what what you want to do in um, – it's a carrot and a stick thing when it comes to dominating people. You have to give them some incentive to be loyal to you, and that is normally prosperity. That's what – you know, authoritarian states want to want to lean on is, you know, hey, you know, you've got your life, you've got your family, you've got your job. OK, so just don't shut up and don't complain. And, you know, you can keep that. And if people are too uppity, what you do is you um, you selectively either what you do is you crack down very hard on specific individuals and you scare the rest of the community or you you piecemeal uh, take away what people have and what they value. Um, and, you know, that in scares them into not resisting anymore because they don't want to lose what they have left. 
But here in this case, these state governments, uh, which don't have you know uh, much experience in authoritarian rule, um, are taking away everything that their citizens have all at once. I mean, I've never you know I can't think of any point in history uh, when a uh, a government has been asking for revolution. Uh, more than the U.S. states are asking right now. And again, I haven't said I haven't said anything about the federal government because Trump is playing this pretty smart, playing a somewhat of a, 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 a at best neutral, if not leaning on the side of opening things up and being skeptical, and uh, and you know berating these state governors for being too tyrannical. I mean, the language he used in his tweets, "Liberate Michigan," that is a revolutionary slogan. And so, oddly enough, I mean, if, if something like this were to happen, what you probably, you know, wouldn't see, uh, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't see uh, these people rising up and declaring independence from the U.S. and establishing the Republic of Michigan or something like that. Uh, they would, you know, rise up, overthrow their state government, and say and pledge their loyalty to the federal government, which would be very funny. Now, if this started happening, I don't think that uh, uh, that it would be, you know in the long run would be a very positive thing for the union. But in the short run, it sure would be kind of funny. But make no mistake, Trump is is doing a bit to incite this. I think that these people are following his cues, uh, certainly. I, I mean, this is largely spontaneous. This is based off of real anger and angst that people are feeling. But I think that, that Trump gave them space to, to let those feelings out. You know, he basically made it okay to say, you know, hey, you're allowed... Uh, to, to dissent here. And people are expressing uh, their dissent. And so this is by no means going away. This is going to get much worse, even if things open back up, because what's going to happen? The economy is still going to be trashed. Uh, we're still in a depression. We still have you know 18% unemployment, last I checked. This reminds me a little bit of the Arab Spring, and actually while I'm on that topic, I should talk about the social media sites' responses to all this, Facebook in particular. Um, Facebook was a huge vector uh, for protesters uh, during the Arab Spring. This is how it spread so quickly throughout the Arab world. People were seeing protests online, and they were organizing themselves all through uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook. And uh, tw- uh, they were very happy back then, the social media sites, to do that, to, uh, to provide a platform for all of these dissidents. And they saw it as, you know, oh, look, we're assisting people who want freedom. And it sounded great, didn't it? Well, now that it's come around that the uh, the people who are being protested now are the U.S. government, uh, Facebook has changed its tune. Now they're shutting down people who are organizing protests, uh, trying to suppress their First Amendment rights in coordination, they say, with state governments. Now, why didn't they do this back during the Arab Spring? Why didn't they coordinate with Hosni Mubarak to shut down protests uh, in Egypt? Well, it's pretty simple because, uh, you know, Facebook is part of the American establishment. And uh, back then, the conventional wisdom had shifted in the U.S. uh, that, uh, you know, dictators were bad. And so we needed to overthrow all the dictators. And so Facebook assisted in that. But now, now that people want to overthrow our, uh, you know, authoritarian dictators, these people who have just seized power and shut down our society, uh, Facebook's not having any of that. And let me tell you, in the short run, maybe they're able to stop a couple of protests, but this is not going to um, <laughs> this is not going to stop people. This is going to make people more angry. This is going to make the problem worse. This justifies people's feelings and magnifies them. I mean, who could look at this uh, from their perspective and not see how the system is trying to quash them and erase their voices um, and oppress them? So these efforts obviously will backfire. The protests will get bigger. This is going to spread, like with what happened with the Arab Spring, um, like wildfire through social media. People are going to see what's going on, and they will be inspired. This is, you know, actually this is something that political scientists study. You know, at what point do you get that um, that critical mass to where there's so many people on the streets? Because every time that, that you see a protest on the street, there's a certain amount of people, um, and it will inspire other people to go out onto the streets. And as that number grows, more and more people see that and, and want to join that movement because there's this fear or uh, of being involved. There's sort of this, depending on how many people, the smaller the number of people are involved, the less um, people are going to be um, encouraged. It's a bandwagoning effect, essentially. The more, the more you see protesters out on the streets, the more people are going to want to jump on that protest bandwagon. And so this is going to pick up steam actually exponentially, like the virus, we could say. 
so it depends then uh, how how the state governments respond to this. If they respond by trying to ease restrictions ever so slightly, if they give some concessions to these protesters, um, I think that they will appease people. I don't think that these are people who are revolutionary at heart yet. They want a very specific goal, kind of like what ha- um, the opposite of what was happening with the Yellow Vest. The Yellow Vest got out in the streets to protest attacks on diesel fuel. Uh, and then it evolved very quickly into much more than that. Uh, and so it got to the point to where uh, the Yellow Vest wanted to overthrow Macron. Now, these protests are not there yet. These protests just want to reopen things. So if you give them some concessions on that front, I think that you will stop them from going any further and radicalizing, which, again, I personally wouldn't like. I would like to see these become a general protest against you know, government in the United States. But if I were advising one of these governors, that's what I would do. Try and make these people feel like their voices are being heard. But instead, you know, we're seeing a lot of governors respond with indignation. Of course, the governor in Georgia said that uh, things are apparently going to open up back there again. He announced that maybe by uh, next Monday, restaurants would be open again. And of course, Austria in Europe is trying to open things up back up. So I think we're going to see this play out. Either you're going to have certain politicians who are going to soften what's going on in their states, um, or you're going to see them harden up. And And in the places where they harden up, these protests are just going to get worse and worse. So with that said, if you gained anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe because I do upload every day and I'd hate to have you miss one. So I'll see folks back here tomorrow.